and I will also record on Zoom to as a backup. Okay, great. Okay. So so we are on the record already? Uh yes. It already started. Is is it okay? Yeah, no, it was, it was I, I just uh, I'm afraid that I will when it really starts. Yeah, no, no, you're right, you're right. Yeah, okay, it's it actually shows. Okay. Very good. Okay. Ah uh, yes, live. It's written. Don't yeah, don't debouse yourself because you are uh, on record. <laughs> Areas from now on only politically correct things. Yeah, yeah you have to watch yourself. <laughs> <laughs> Everything you will say uh, <laughs> will haunt you. Now, now we have more participants than we usually have for our seminar. Meanwhile, announce that uh, we have scheduled our seminar for a month ahead till uh, June 17. Uh, the next uh, speaker, ah, except June 3. We, I don't have a speaker for June 3 yet, but I will have for sure I have several candidates. Uh, so uh, the next speaker is Jordan Ganev in a week. And uh, then on uh, June 10, we will have Steve Miller. And uh, on June 17, uh, your thumb handle. That, that's the plan. So th this seminar, it's actually Weizmann Representation Theory and Algebraic Geometry Seminar, started by Anthony Joseph, regularly organized by Maria Gorelik, uh, Rami Eisenbot, and myself. And uh, in this uh, virtual form, so far, it's me and Eris. We will see what other organizers uh, will join. We are, we, we plan this seminar, this virtual seminar already some three weeks ago, but uh, now we are motivated to continue it by the success of the conference. I would like to thank again everyone who was there and those of us who could not be there, the conference is on YouTube. You can see it on my channel. So my channel is just like my name, Dmitry Gurevich. And on the same channel, we are streaming this seminar, and we are already streaming, so be careful. And also, I repeat again that I shared with you Rafael's presentation in the chat. And you can also see it in the Google the seminar announcements. I will also put presentation there. Link. Uh, uh -huh.
Oh, so, okay, I will. Okay. Yeah, Eras, please. Okay, so uh, welcome all to the Weizmann seminar now in the new platform, mm -hmm. uh, building on the success of uh, last week conference. And so the first speaker in this new platform is we are very uh, happy to have uh, Rafael Buzar Plessis. Uh, after uh, two months of uh, national lockdown, I guess. And uh, note that uh, we are already recording it, and it's uh, also live on YouTube. So uh, take note of that. Okay, please, Rafael. Thank you. Okay. So thank you, Erez, for the introduction. And uh, I should say I'm very glad to be speaking at yeah, this new. Zoom version of your seminar. And uh, so it's good to see that uh, things continue to be running. And I would like therefore to, to, to thank uh, the organizers and especially Dima and Erez for the invitation. Okay, so uh, first, what I'm going to talk about here is a, a joint work. Everything is joint work with uh, Yifeng Yu, Wei Zhang, and Xin Wen Su. And uh, so it concerns uh, a new way to isolate uh, cuspidal representations from other automorphic representations, and uh, in particular the continuous spectrum. And as the, data, the title suggests, our original motivation was uh, to the so-called Gangos facet conjecture. And I will come to this at the end and explain how our construction can be applied to this. Conjecture. But uh, so let me first start. I uh, cannot see the. Yes. So let me first start by discussing some previous work of uh, Linden Strauss and Venkatesh uh, that can be seen in some sense. So it's uh, very close to what we, we do, and it can be seen in some sense as a precursor of the result in our paper. So more precisely in a paper of uh, 2005, I think, of Linden Schroes and Venkatesh, they give uh, what you might call a soft proof of uh, Weyl's law for spherical cast forms on congruent uh, locally symmetric spaces. And here by soft, I really mean that they avoid any um, delicate analytic uh, study of Eisenstein series or equivalently of the continuous part of the transformer. And how they achieve this is precisely by constructing certain convolution operators, which uh, automatically kill everything that is in the continuous spectrum. So let me just quickly review what they did in the simplest non-trivial case, which is the case of even mass forms. So I'll let H be the upper half plane that I see here as the quotient of the group G, so PGL2R, by its uh, standard maximal compact subgroup, so the projective orthogonal group into variables. And I denote by gamma, the lattice PGL2Z, which is acting on H uh, by left multiplication. So now we can form the L2 space of the quotient. And on this space, we have a natural action of uh, the space of smooth, compactly supported K B invariant functions, so also called spherical functions on G. By right convolution, because the convolution by such functions preserves uh, invariance by k on the right, of course. And for this action, for example, we have a, a spectral decomposition of the L2 space. Uh, so it decomposes as, uh, so you have the cuspidal part, I, I did not L2 in, index cusp. Then you have some residual spectrum, which reduces here to the constant functions. And then you have a continuous part, which is spanned by uh, unitary even adjacent series, which is the continuous integral there. And um, so this is a decomposition with respect to this action in, in the sense that it decomposes the space uh, as a, essentially a direct sum of eigenfunctions for this action. And the action by convolution of these spherical functions is relatively easy to describe on the adjacent series. So more precisely, if I take a small k to be a spherical function, then uh, its action, so capital R will always denote a high convolution. 
Its action on the Eisenstein series with parameter one half plus lambda is given by, so it's an eigenfunction, as I said, and the eigenvalue is given by what is called the spherical transform of the spherical function K. So it's a kind of integral transform is given by this uh, integral of K against a function that I denoted by psi lambda. Psi lambda is, it's simply uh, normalized ma uh, spherical matrix coefficient for the principal series of PGL 2 r with parameter lambda. And this is just a way to say that the Eisenstein series is a spherical vector generating a, such a principal series. And uh, so this is a precise description of what are the eigenvalues of the Eisenstein series. And what's important here is that we can actually describe exactly what is the image of this spherical transform. So this is a kind of Palevina theorem, which in this case, I think is due to Elgazen. And it says that this map, uh, sending a spherical function to a spherical transform, induces a, a, an isomorphism between the space of spherical functions and what I call here the uh, space of even Palevina functions. And so uh, just recall that the Palevina space is uh, classically defined. So you, you can describe it as a space of holomorphic functions on a complex plane, but so a quick definition of it here is as the Fourier transform of the space of usual event test functions on the real life. And so the idea of Linda Strauss and Van Ketesh is to um, was to mix these uh, convolutional operators with other operators because here we, we are in an arithmetic setting. So you have other operators acting. So namely you have echo operators. And if I denote by TP the standard echo operator at P then the Eisenstein series is also eigenfunction for this operator with eigenvalue p to the lambda plus p to the minus lambda. Uh, again, the, there's an explicit formula for the uh, eigenvalue. And uh, this, uh, so this motivates following definition. So we are now going to uh, mimic the action of the echo operator uh, on the using Archimedean convolution. So I denote by up the endomorphism of the space of spherical functions, which is given explicitly uh, on the spherical transform by multiplying by this function, giving the eigenvalue of the cooperator on Argentine series. And so it's really easy to see that this multiplication preserves the Palevina space so that uh, we, are, we have just defined really an endomorphism of the space of spherical functions. And uh, so this is the first example of a kind of operator that will you encounter again afterwards. So because this is an operator which is spectrally given just by multiplication by a function, we call it a multiplier. And so why did we define this? Because once you have this endomorphism, you can now define a new operator by mixing Archimedean convolution with uh, echo operator. So I define RPK to be this so com the composition of TP with uh, high convolution by K minus high convolution by UP of K. And by these uh, computations that I just, so the, the computations of the eigenvalues of the series, you see that this operator automatically kills everything that is not cusp below. So that's good. And uh, in order to show that, for example, there is at least one cusp form there, you need to arrange this operator to be uh, non-zero still. Otherwise, it won't be interesting. And it's not very hard to show. So for example, you can, uh, so there is this property that I in the cusp, uh, Archimedean convolution somehow also commute with horizontal translation. So if you think in terms of the standard fundamental domain, when you are I in the cusp, there's an action of the circle by translations. So yes, yeah, not quite true because we are working with PGL to Z. So you have to fold the uh, fundamental domain along the unitary axis, but so you have to consider even linear combinations of horizontal translations, but let's not worry about that. But so these convolutions, they commute with horizontal translations, but the, the cooperator, it's relatively easy to see that it doesn't. And using this, it's relatively easy to deduce that we can arrange this uh, operator RPK to be non zero for example, by taking its uh, commutator with uh, horizontal translations and then letting K converge to some Dirac. Oh, when you say high, you mean some asymptotic result or after no, some No, 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 it's really, it's really, yes. If you are, yes. 
sufficiently high in the cusp, then it commutes on the nose with horizontal translations. And so from this uh, quick argument, you deduce uh, immediately, so it's a very soft argument to show the existence of even cuspidal mass forms, for example, which is already nice. And so uh, Lindenschloss and Venkatesh, actually, they did far more in their paper. Sorry, Raphael, I'm a bit confused about the definition of this uh, UP operator. I mean, it's it's multiplying the Satake transform by P to the lambda plus P to the minus lambda, right? Right. But this is exactly the action of the TP operator. How does it differ from multiplying by the TP operator? The TP is not acting on spherical functions. It's acting on the Eisenstein series. But acting by UP, so this is, yes, th this is made so that the action of UP of K is the same as the action of K composed with TP on Eisenstein series. So this is why the difference between the two kills the... But why, I mean, TP is also, I don't understand why UP of anything is not that operator composed with TP. Uh, it's not because it's, uh, uh, UP is, you, you are still acting on the right after applying UP. It's, it's not it's not a PID convolution operator. It's what a convolution. It, hmm? It's not a pair. UP is not a PID convolution. No, operator. no, no. But no, what it's, really, what? it's a purely Archimedean operator. Oh, it's an Archimedean operator. Right, right. So you can right. define it. It depends on the prime P. I see. I didn't And it mimics the action of TP, but only on the Eisenstein series. I see. I see. Okay. Okay. The, the, the point is that there is a um, strong relations between the Archimedean and uh, Aker eigenvalues for Eisenstein's are that. not shared by cuspidal forms. Yeah, I thought you were wrong. Yes. Yeah. Okay. So actually what they did in the, the paper, they constructed this kind of operators far more generally. So namely for uh, congruence quotient of locally symmetric spaces associated to split hydrogen group of a cube. And in this way, they were able to construct many cast forms to show that there are many cast forms for such uh, locally symmetric space and making this, uh, uh, quantifying this using some kind of trace formula, they were able to deduce from this the way slope. So, uh, as you will see, we have a similar construction, but I would like to make some two remarks before moving on in order to compare uh, this construction of Linden Strauss and Bankatesh to what we do. So uh, the first point is that the unfortunately Linden Strauss and Bankatesh operators also they will kill the continuous spectrum that can they will also always kill some interesting automorphic forms like symmetric square lift of forms on GL2. And this, of course, is not problematic to deduce the way slow because these forms are negligible in some sense. But when you want to apply this construction to some trace formula where you compare trace formula for a group and trace formula for another smaller group, you expect to, uh, I mean, you, you really need to see uh, lift from this smaller group in the bigger group on the spectral side of your trace formula. And so this can be problematic. And the second point is that this construction of Linda Schloss and Venkatesh is only for spherical cross forms at the Archimedean place. And so we, of course, would like to get rid of this, of this. Okay, so now I start to explain what we do in the paper. And one important point is that we'll not be working with compactly supported functions at the Archimedean place. So I'm going to explain this now. So we start with a connected or adductive group of a Q and I denote as usual by A, the Adel ring. And once and for all, I will fix a level. By this, I mean a, a compact open subgroup of the uh, uh, point of G in the finite adults. And I will also fix a finite set of primes S such that this compact open subgroup is hyperspatial at all primes outside S. Okay, so K and S are fixed 
from now on. Uh, as I just say, that the Archimedean place will need to work with this slightly bigger space, which is called the Schwarz space. And a quick definition of it is as a space of smooth functions on G of R, such that for all polynomial differential operator D, uh, D applied to F is bounded. But since polynomial differential operator includes multiplication by polynomial, in particular, uh, it, uh, this condition implies that your function is actually very rapidly decreasing together with all uh, its derivatives. So this is a space we'll consider. It has been considered by other authors uh, in the literature. So maybe Gasselman and Varlak and also Foucault de Clou. And it has been also considered by Gurevich and Eisenberg in some more general setting. But, so we'll, it's, it's really important to work with this space and I will explain why later. And just to give you an analog of what this space is. So if you uh, specialize to the multiplicative group and uh, you use the exponential map to identify half of it with the real line, then you end up with what I call here the exponential Schwarz space. So the space of function on the real line, which are whose all derivatives are decaying more rapidly than any exponential. And this flat space, it's relatively easy to see that it's an algebra under convolution. It's closed under this operator. OK, so once we have the Archimedean Schwarz space, we can define the global Schwarz space, which is basically just the restricted tensor product of this Schwarz space at the uh, real place. And at finite places, I would just take uh, the algebra of KP, KP invariant functions on G of QP. So I just recall here what this means. So this is linear combinations of products of functions at all places, where at the Archimedean place, you have a Schwarz functions. And uh, at uh, the finite primes, you have the characteristic function of your hyperspatial maximum compact for almost all P. OK, so this will be our space of convolution operators. And now, uh, I will introduce some uh, algebra of multipliers acting on this global Schwarz space. So again, we'll have uh, local multipliers first. And for uh, finite primes outside of S, I will just use a spherical equal algebra, which is the same as the local space of functions we were using. And so it's acting on itself by convolution. And this will be my space of multipliers. At the Archimedean place, so we are doing something uh, slightly different. We'll take, so I define M infinity of G to be the space of all B module continuous endomorphism of the Schwarz space. And so it's acting on the Schwarz space by its very definition. And so the definition, this definition might seem at first sight uh, a bit abstract, but we'll see later that we can construct very explicit elements there. And another way to see this space is as a space of, in a certain sense, rapidly decaying invariant distributions on G of R. So, and uh, there's a way to make sense of this. And then it's acting on the short space just by convolution of distributions. Okay, so I will again denote the action by convolution. And out of this, you can construct uh, the global algebra of what I call S multipliers. So I, I just don't consider uh, primes which are ramified, but otherwise it's the uh, restricted tensor product of all the local multiplier algebras. And it's acting on the Schwarz space by convolution. OK, so now I, I have defined everything uh, uh, that I need to state the main theorem. And this will be on the next slide. So we construct what we call quasi cuspidal convolution operators in the paper. So you start with pi, an irreducible cuspidal representation of uh, G of the Adels, uh, having fixed vector by k, the level. And uh, in particular, prime outside of S, the representation is unramified and the local multiplier algebra, which at P is just, a, as I said, the spherical equal algebra is acting on the KP fixed vector by a character that I denote by lambda P of pi. 
And this is just the SATA key parameter. Uh, we need to impose a condition on the irreducible this Caspian representation. So we'll say that this is S cap if uh, its SATA key parameters are the same as the nice and chance series. So this is this condition. And of course, if uh, pi is the same as the representation generated by Eisenstein series, then we have no chance to isolate it from the continuous spectrum. So which is why we need to impose the condition that pi is not S cap. And now I can state the main theorem, which is here. So we assume that pi is not S cap, as I say. And then we can construct a global S multiplier, mu pi, such that for every Schwarz, global Schwarz test function, so I can act by mu pi on F, and then the right convolution of the result uh, kills everything that is not cuspidal. This is the first condition. But of course, we want it to not to kill the original representation we had. And so the, this is why we have the second condition that the action of mu pi convol with f is the same as the action of f on pi. So this is the main theorem. And I would like to make two remarks just now. So just to put things into perspective, let me recall that when g is gln, it's known that every cuspidal representation is not s cap. This follows from the strong multiplicity one theorem of uh, Jacquet and Shalika. And the second remark is that uh, actually, so I, yeah, I stated one version of the theorem in the paper we have another version, but as you will see, the proof is quite uh, robust. And this allows to prove actually in the same way, many variants of it. So for example, we might be interested in not isolating one cuspidal representation, but maybe a cuspidal datum. So and this, this is something that we can also do. Okay, so maybe I will I should pause there and ask if there is any questions so far, because afterwards I will discuss the proof. So, is there a question? So the second identity is on the cuspidal part? Uh, the yes, the second identity is under yes pi, so only pi in the cuspidal part. Yes, but pi was cuspidal. Mm -hmm. So we ask that our multiplier doesn't kill the cuspidal representation we started with. Fine. Okay, so now I will start discussing the proof, but first I need to make some detour and I need to discuss more thoroughly what, uh, what is this space of multipliers. Uh, more precisely, we need a spectral description of them. So from now on and for simplicity, I will just assume that the group G is split and I fix a Borel subgroup and I denote by A the universal carton that is the, the, the torus quotient of B. So B mod, it's a unipotent radical. Denote by W the Weyl group. And I will, because we'll need to consider many different places to have something uniform, I'll introduce the dual torus, A. So A art is just the, the so it's a, just the tensor product of the, so X star of A is the character group of A, tensor with C star. So first I will review the well-known description of uh, periodic multipliers, which is just a SATA isomorphism. So let me recall that you can identify for each prime P uh, this dual torus with the group of unramified characters of A of QP. So this group I denote by AP at. And the isomorphism, for example, given by mapping character, algebra character tensors by A to the S to the absolute periodic absolute value of the character to the S. And so now there is the SATA isomorphism. So this is the spectral description of the spherical equal algebra. So it gives you an isomorphism between uh, the spherical equal algebra and the ring of W invariant regular functions on the torus of unramified characters that they are denoted by. So the, this transform is denoted by new maps to new art. And it's characterized by this property that if lambda is an unramified 
character of uh, maximal torus. And V lambda is a spherical vector in the normalized parabolic induction of this character. Then uh, mu is acting on this vector by the value of its spherical, of its Satake transform at lambda. So we we'll look for a similar thing at the Archimedean place. And for abstract reason, we have something like this. So now we take mu to be an Archimedean multiplier. And uh, then by sure lemma, uh, its action on any reducible and miscible representation of g of r is given by a scalar that I denote by mu out of point infinity. And again, from abstract reason, you can see that this function that associates to pi infinity mu out of pi infinity it characterizes entirely uh, the multiplier mu. And so what we'll do, uh, what I will do in the next few slides is try to describe for you uh, subalgebra of the algebra of Archimedean multipliers by describing for you what uh, are the spectral transform. So for this, let me recall the addition of isomorphism. So the center of the enveloping algebra on the left. So here you see, this is the center of the, uh, so of the complexified enveloping algebra is isomorphic to the ring of uh, W invariant regular functions on the dual of the complexified Lie algebra of A. So this is Arishandra theorem, but the dual of the complexified Lie algebra of A is the same as the Lie algebra of the dual torus. So you get also this uh, other description as the ring of regular functions on the Lie algebra of A art. And as you all know, if you have an irreducible representation of G of R, it has an infinitesimal character, and I will denote it by lambda infinity of the representation. So it's a character of uh, the center of the enveloping algebra, but by Arishandra isomorphism, you can, and I will identify it with a W orbit in the Lie algebra of the dual torus. So actually, we'll only look from Archimedean multipliers uh, with for, uh, spectral transform only depends on the infinitesimal character. So I will not describe for you all the multipliers and we not need them. So we concentrate on those and I will denote the set of them by a superscript inf and we call them infinitesimal multipliers. So So in the next slide, uh, in order to describe what uh, algebra of infinitesimal multipliers we need for the proof, I need to review some basic facts on representation theory of real uh, reductive groups. Very basic, but I will also introduce some more notations. So actually what I need is the set of all tempered irreducible, represent irreducible representations of G of R, and so this is temper dual, and I did not it this way, so G R R temp, and actually what we care about is the set of the uh, infinitesimal characters, so I did not by inf temp, the set of infinitesimal characters of tempered representations. And as I said previously, I'm going to identify this with a subset of the Lie algebra of the dual torus mod W. So actually we'll need slightly more. And uh, I will have to introduce a certain notion of uh, what we call uh, tubular neighborhood of this uh, set of tempered infinitesimal characters. And the quicker way to introduce this is probably to recall Arishandra description of the tempered representations in terms of discrete series. So uh, Arishandra proved that uh, tempered Irreducible open, sorry, an irreducible representation is tempered if and only if you can find a standard parabolic subgroup, so just a parabolic containing B, with, uh, so I denote by M the Levy quotient of P, so it's quotient of P by its unipotent radical, and further I denote by AM the torus quotient of P, so this is the quotient of the Levy quotient by its derived subgroup. So uh, there exists such a P and a discrete series sigma of the Levy quotient plus uh, lambda, which is a purely imaginary element in the dual, dual of the complexified Lie algebra 
of AM such that so that you can identify with a unitary you know, ramified character of the Levy such that by infinity embeds in the normalized induction of sigma tensor with lambda. And so the Lie algebra of the dual of the Lie algebra of AM naturally embeds in the Lie, dual of the Lie algebra of A because this is a question of A and we have identified this already with the Lie algebra of the dual torus. So now we we'll define a tubular neighborhood of the set of template representations. So it depends on some positive real number C. And I would say that per infinity is in the tubular neighborhood of the tempered dual with width C. If there exists similar data as before, except that now we take lambda, lambda is not necessarily imaginary, but it's real part as to have a norm bounded by C. So here also I have implicitly fixed a norm on this Lie algebra, but uh, I mean, this is not really important, such that by infinity embeds in the same normalized parabolic induction as before of sigma tensor with lambda. So that way to define tubular neighborhood of the tempered dual. And so, as I said, we only care about infinite small characters. So I would denote by inf temp smaller than C, the set of infinite small characters of representations in this tubular neighborhood. And again, I identify this with a subset of the Lie algebra of the dual torus mod W. So just let me just give an example before moving on. So when G is SL2, the Lie algebra of the dual torus is just C and W is acting by plus or minus one. And then the set of tempered infinitesimal characters, just the uh, imaginary line, which corresponds to the unitary principle series, union with the uh, integers. So non-zero integers corresponds to, they correspond to uh, discrete series. And now uh, infinitesimal neighbor, uh, sorry, a tubular neighborhood of this is just the union of some uh, vertical band centered around the imaginary axis with the integers, okay. okay. Just give this example so that you, uh, you see what it looks like. And of course, in general, it's similar, but since the, the, when the rank is higher, it's, uh, it's more complicated to, to write down, but uh, so it's essentially the, the idea. Okay, so, on the next slide, I'm going to state the second main theorem, which is a theorem about multipliers at the Archimedean place. And uh, it's using this notion of tubular neighbor. So there it is. So let mu at be an holomorphic function on the Lie algebra of the dual torus. And assume we have to assume two things. So of course, we have to assume that it's W invariant so that we can really see this as a function on the space of infinitesimal characters now. And then there's a growth condition. And the growth condition is that new art is bounded on uh, any of these infinitesimal neighborhood, uh, sorry, tubular neighborhood of the infinitesimal tempered characters. And then uh, there exists the infinitesimal Archimedean multipliers whose uh, spectral transform is this new art. So this is the theorem. And this is what we need for the proof of theorem A. So of course, there are already different multiplier algebras that have been constructed previously in the literature. So let me review them quickly. And let me explain the difference between them and what we have here. So the first one is Arthur's multipliers. So Arthur's uh, needed it to develop the trace formula and he constructed a certain algebra of multipliers. So not for the Schwartz space, but for, so we have to fix here a maximal compact subgroup, K infinity. And it's algebra of multipliers that I denote by N infinity A is acting. So on the space of 
usual test functions that are moreover uh, k-finite on both sides. And this multiplier algebra is relatively easy to describe because this is the usual Palevinus space on the Lie algebra of the dual torus, uh, which are, so the Palevinus functions, which are W invariant. So, and there I recall, so it's the same as the usual Fourier transform of the space of W invariant uh, test functions on the real Lie algebra of A. So, uh, there is a ex classical explicit description of what is a Palevinus space. And Palevinus space is basically described by two conditions. So these are functions that are holomorphic. And then there are two conditions. So the first one is that these functions should be rapidly decaying in vertical steps. But there is also a second condition that your holomorphic function should be at worst of exponential growth. And this condition of being bounded by an exponential is really problematic to what we, we really need to get rid of it, as I will explain, because this condition, for example, um, with this condition, you cannot find a multiplier which vanishes on uh, some given countable set of points. So for example, you cannot find a usual polyvinial function vanishing at the all the integers. It's not possible. And it's a, a easy exercise using a, a stone bayer stars. So this is why we cannot use uh, Arthur multipliers. So fortunately, there is another construction in the literature, which is due to the law. So the LORM has constructed another multiplier algebra, which is slightly bigger, and which this time is acting not on the uh, space of test functions, so compactly supported functions, but really on the Schwartz space. But once again, with this limitation to uh, k finite functions on both sides. And so the, this multiplier, this algebra of multipliers of the LORM can also be described explicitly in terms of the usual Fourier transform as the Fourier transform of W invariant uh, functions, which are exponentially Schwartz on the real Lie algebra of uh, A. So we call that by exponentially Schwartz, here I mean that functions on a real vector space whose all derivatives are decaying faster than any exponential. So then again, I mean, you have a, a, a variant of the usual polyvinear theorem describing what is the Fourier transform of this. And basically this is the same as before, except that you don't have the condition of being bounded by an exponential. So there is no growth condition in the real direction. Also, you still have the condition of rapid decaying vertical strips. So this is more or less what we want, but so uh, it's closer to the algebra of multipliers described in theorem B and actually, we also need to get rid of the k finite assumption. So not just because it's uh, satisfactory to get something without this condition, but also it's somehow crucial. It's important for the application to the kind of positive conjecture, for example. And very roughly, it's because uh, when you have a comparison between trace formulas, usually we don't know that the transfer preserves k finite functions. Or maybe we know it, but then it's not something that is obvious usually. So uh, the point is that we need to show that some part of this multiplier algebra extends to the wall short space. And for this, I mean, since k finite functions are dense there, we can just show that they extend by continuity. And for this, we use a combination of an L2 argument, which is essentially, by this I mean the Planchard formula of Arishandra. And then there is uh, also uh, an argument using uh, answerization by finite, dim finite dimensional representation. So very roughly, you need another. So if you remember my definition of the short space, I ask that the, uh, when you apply a polynomial differential operator to a function, you get something that is bounded. So in, in L infinity, but you have a similar description by asking that all the polynomial when you apply any polynomial differential operator to a function, then it's L2. So we actually use instead this description, which gives you 
set, a complete set of uh, semi-norms on the Schwarz space, which are derivatives of L2 norms. And when uh, you take one norm, which is just deriv uh, derivative of the L2 norm by a differential operator, which is right or left invariant, you can just use the L2 argument. But when you want to multiply by polynomial, you have to tensor by a finite dimensional representation because tensoring by finitely Finite dimensional representation is something that is kind of dual to multiplying by polynomial. But this is all I'm going to say about this. Rafael, can I ask uh, two quick questions? Of course. So the first question is the obvious one, whether the converse of theorem B holds. The second, since I don't have intuition, does the poly do you have examples where the polynomial, the degree of the polynomial depends on C? Mm. Uh, that's maybe it's possible. I, I, okay, I, I didn't think about this. It might be possible, but really, we need we, we, we don't need the degree of the polynomial in the proof to depend on to, to, to be independent on C. So then, if you can come up with a holomorphic function satisfying these conditions, but with the degree depending on C, then okay, I, did, I didn't think about it. And for your first question, uh, do I understand correctly that you're asking if this is the set of all uh, multipliers? Factoring through the lambda yes. infinity. So uh, this is something I'm going to I'm going to discuss a bit uh, at the very end. So, but this is open question. Okay. Okay. So this ends my discussion of the Archimedean multipliers, and now I would like to explain. Uh, roughly how we use this to prove theorem A. So here I recall the statement. So the statement is this, start with a cuspid representation, which is not SK. And then you can find a, a global S multiplier, which when you convolve with uh, any global Schwartz function, kills everything that is not cuspidal, but uh, preserve the action of your Schwartz function on the given cuspidal representation. So let me, um, give an overview of the proof, but the proof is, uh, I will give you the main idea, it's not uh, very difficult once you see it. So uh, basically we are going to translate everything on the spectral side, and then it will become a, a kind of an exercise in function theory. So I introduce this set XS, this is a set of global uh, spectral parameters somehow. So it's the product of the, and I, I, I have described everything in terms of the dual torus, which is quite convenient. So at the Archimedean place, you have the set of infinitesimal characters so I, that I describe as the algebra of the dual torus mod W. And then at uh, finite primes outside of S, I have, I have the set of Satake parameters, which is the, the quotient of the torus of an ramified characters, A, mod W. But this torus of an ramified characters, I call that you can identify it for each p to the dual torus. So this is my set of uh, spectral parameters. And to pi, I can associate an element there. So by just uh, associating to it, first it's infinitesimal character at the Archimedean place, and then at uh, finite and ramified primes, uh, it's Satake parameter. So lambda infinity is the uh, infinitesimal character and lambda p is the static parameter. Of course, you can do the same for any assumption series with level, uh, level k, right? And uh, then I would denote by x, so lambda s of e is a, a spectral parameter of your assumption series, and I denote by x s Eisenstein the subset of uh, spectral parameters of all these Eisenstein series. And so by what I uh, described in the previous slides, so now I'm going really, so I put the inf there because we are only considering infinitesimal multipliers at the Archimedean place, but the set of infinitesimal S global S multipliers of G can be seen as a space of functions on this uh, set of spectral parameters. Just 
take the spell tool transform place by place. So at the Archimedean place, it's a function on the space of infinitesimal characters. And at uh, finite primes, I'm just taking this attack a transform, which gives you a function, regular function, on the space of set parameters, right? And so now we have translated the problem to the following one. We are looking for a global infinitesimal S multiplier whose uh, spectral transform vanishes on the set of Eisenstein spectral parameters, but not on the spectral parameter of pi. And not that the, the, the condition of being, not being S cap implies and is more or less equivalent to the fact that lambda S of pi is not in the space of Eisenstein spectral parameters. So that this is a meaningful question. And so in the next slide, I'm going to explain how we can do this in two steps and why we need this extension of the multiplier algebra of R2. So for this, I recall that Eisenstein series are actually, they come in, in, in families, it's uh, unknown. So more precisely, if you fix a, a standard parabolic subgroup with a Levy quotient M and Torres quotient AM as before, and you fix so sigma here is a, sorry. sigma is a, a automorphic representation. So essentially of the Levy, but actually I take the induction, which gives you a automorphic representation uh, in this space. And so sigma and P are uh, being fixed and what varies in the family is a form phi in the space of sigma and lambda and uh, an ramified character of m essentially. So we can twist phi by lambda and then form the Eisenstein series and you, you get a family like this. Okay. And so what we want to kill is exactly the spectral parameters of those families. And moreover, it's relatively easy to describe more uh, what is the a set of spectral parameters of one such family. So namely, it's in, in the, <clears throat> the image in the set of uh, spectral parameters of a coset for this subgroup, where you vary lambda. So lambda is any an ramified character, so an element in the complex, complexified dual of the Lie algebra of AM. And at the Archimedean place, you are translating by this, by lambda. And at uh, finite primes outside f, you are multiplying by p to the lambda. So p to the lambda is an element in the, it's the exponential map for the dual torus actually. Right? And it's living in the torus of an ramified character at p. Okay, so now uh, the proof is essentially in two steps because we have infinite number of, of families. We are going to use uh, a rich finiteness result, which tells you that the infinitesimal character of pi appears as the infinitesimal character of uh, Nisenstein series in one of these family, only finitely, fin I mean, uh, I don't know, for only a finite number of such families. So this is essentially a rational finiteness because we fix, we fix the level from the beginning. And uh, for the remaining one, so the set of infinitesimal, infinitesimal characters in one family as by the previous description, this is just an affine subspace. This is the image of an affine subspace in the Lie algebra of the dual torus. And moreover, uh, these affine subspace are in some sense quite sparse. So they are uh, going to infinity and sufficiently fast in some way. So this can be deduced from the result of Donnelly or another way to see it is by uh, making a Richandra finiteness effective. Then you get something like this. And because of this, so now we have a countable family of affine subspaces, which are going to infinity sufficiently fast. And then this is a well-known uh, fact in a complex, uh, fun fun um, in the theory of complex functions, complex analytic functions that you can find uh, multipliers, infinitesimal multiplier at the Archimedean place uh, with the spectral transform vanishes at all uh, this essentially the image of these affine subspaces when they don't contain the infinitesimal character of pi. So this is where we really need to use something which is bigger than Arthur multiplier algebra, because it's something we cannot do with the usual polylinear functions. But here, since we don't have any uh, condition, gross condition in the direction or 
holomorphic function can be basically of arbitrary order, so finite or infinite, and this allows you to do this. And so this first step is purely, purely Archimedean, and this allows you to kill all the families except the finite number and not killing part. And then for the remaining one, we use this uh, description of what is, uh, what is the set of spectral parameters in one family. You see that this is something which is actually you can cut out by uh, functions which are uh, spectral transform from multipliers. So yeah, I say that actually, so I, I will not do it precisely, but uh, if you, before modding out by W at all places, you can consider functions of this form. So where you, uh, so you mix the Archimedean parameter and the local parameter at a prime P. So you compare them by taking the quotient of lambda P by uh, P to the power, the infinitesimal character. So they are comparable and then of course, because uh, lambda s of f is a uh, coset for uh, this subgroup, then this quotient should be constant over the whole family. And so you apply a character to it minus a constant. This will cut out exactly your family. And this is before dividing by the action of the value groups. And uh, if you want functions which are W invariants, then you need to take some polynomial combinations of those. And not that these functions are actually uh, uh, of polynomial groups is are uh, even bounded in vertical strips in the Archimedean, the Archimedean variable. So it's uh, it's almost in our uh, space of multipliers and it's relatively easy to modify them so that they land in our space of multipliers at the Archimedean place. And as a function of lambda p, it's, it's, a, regular, it's a regular function, so it's fine. So this is basically the idea. Are there any questions so far? Is this uh, result of Donnelly the result on estimating cusp forms? Uh, you mean the previous step? Yeah. Yes, it's a result of estimating the Archimedean um, eigenvalue of cusp forms. It's like Biles law for cusp forms or something. Yes, you need the Archimedean eigenvalues okay. when you sum them, the inverse of them to some power p to converge. Okay, thank you. Yes. So this is the what what I, I meant by this uh, reference to Donnelly. So Donnelly proves something much stronger, but uh, this implies this in particular. Okay. So if there is no other question, uh, then I will move on and just discuss the application to the Gangos Parcel conjecture. Okay. So now we change the setting and we specialize to some particular groups. And we'll see how we can apply this to some comparison of trace formulas. So let E over F, so E, e over F will be quantic extension of number fields. And I, uh, we give ourselves two emission spaces, W and V over E uh, with W contained in V and of respective dimension N and N plus one. And then the group would consider this one. So G is the product of the two the unitary groups of the two emission spaces and H is a small unitary group. And it embeds in the product diagonally. And then consider pi, uh, cuspid holotomorphic representation of G. And it will decompose naturally as a tensor product of uh, automorphic representations of the two unitary groups, so pi V and pi W. So the gang gross passive conjecture concerns uh, the relation between two invariants that you can associate to such a pi. So the first one is the uh, automorphic period. So it's associated to the subgroup H. Uh, it's a linear form on pi, which is defined by just sending a cusp form in space of pi to its integral over the automorphic quotient of H. And the integral is absolutely convergent because um, uh, phi is a cusp form, so it's of rapid decay. And the second invariant you can associate to pi is a L function. So for this, you need to pass to the base change by E of pi to the base change of G to E. So this base change is just the product of two general linear groups of rank n and n plus one. And uh, the base change of pi will decompose as a tensor product of the base change of pi v and pi w. Uh, I should say that this base change is now, so it's a particular case of Langlands functoriality and it's now known to exist in full generality by work of um, Mock and uh, Kaleta, Binges, Shin and White. 
And what we need about this base change is it's a ranking cell bagel function. So now you have two automorphic representations of general linear groups and you can form the, uh, uh, the, the functions of the, the ranking cell bagel functions of the two. And so this is the two invariants and now the conjecture of Gangos process says the following. So you need to assume that the base change is generic. And then uh, it says that the following uh, should be equivalent. So the central value of the ranking cell bag function is non-zero. And the fact that there is a another cuspular automorphic representation by prime with the same base change as pi on which the period is non-zero. So this condition of having the same base change can be, uh, I mean, it's a way to characterize representations in the same L packet. So this is another way to say it. And I should also uh, remark that actually I'm cheating just a little bit because actually the, the, the truth statement mm -hmm. in the real, I mean, the conjecture you should allow pi prime to live not necessarily on the original group G, but maybe on some inner forms. But uh, I will just ignore this uh, issue here. And uh, just to mention, there's also refinement of this conjecture, which is due to each in Keda telling you that, so this, this is giving you now a, a explicit formula relating the square of the norm of the period with the central value of this uh, ranking cell bagel function. I'm not going to state precisely what's the formula, but there is one. And uh, it generalizes the uh, vast project formula on the toric periods for J2, which is essentially the case when n equals one. So the main result uh, we get on this conjecture is this one. So uh, assume that base change is cuspidal, then the conjecture, both conjectures, so both so the gangos prasad conjecture and Ichino Keda one, all for pi. So of course, this was uh, already proved previously in uh, under some extra assumptions on pi. And the novelty here is that we only have one global assumption that the base change is cuspidal. Whereas in previous results, uh, the conditions were local. So I'm going to explain quickly how we did use this on uh, our main theorem on multipliers now. So the sketch of proof is as follows. So we use a comparison of two relative trace formulas that have been proposed by Jack and Radis. And so they have two, you have two tra relative trace formulas. So one did not RTF of G is living on the original group G and the other one is living on this group G prime, which is the group on which the base change of pi is living. And so I'm just going to describe them very quickly. This is how they look like. And this is only formal. So formally, these relative trace formulas, they have a both a spectral and geometric expansion. And on the spectral side, you have the sum of all automorphic forms for the group G and G prime of a product of two periods. So one of them is convolved by the test function that you plug in your test formula. And so in the first test formula, the periods are the one appearing in the Gagos process conjecture. In the second formula, you have two different periods corresponding to two subgroups H1 and H2 of G prime. So H1 is the diagonal GLN that you can embed in G prime. This is called the rankin selbach period because as is known from the work of Jacke, Plesetsky, Shapiro, and Charika, this is essentially giving you an integral representation of the rankin selbergel function at the center. And then you have to put another uh, subgroup, which is this H2. This is again GLN times GLN plus one beta over F. This is a period that has been studied by Flicke and Rallis, and its role here is to detect essentially image uh, base changes, uh, automorphic representations that are base change from G. And so this is a spectral side. And on the other side, you have the geometric sites that I'm not going to describe precisely, but let me just say that these are some of relative analogs of orbital tables. And both the uh, relative trace formulas that depend on test functions f and f prime that you may take to be in the global Schwarz spaces. So the problem is that neither expression makes sense in general. So if you look at the spectral sites, you see that it cannot make sense actually uh, as it is written, unless you sum over the cuspidal spectrum. So, however, if uh, f and f prime, so the operator of five convolutions by f and f prime, only detect cuspidal representations, 
then you are fine, at least for the left hand sides, then you can make sense of them and everything is absolutely convergent there. And the right hand side, I'm not going to talk too much about it, but uh, it has been completely regularized uh, by Michel Isidore, so we can use this. And the problem is that the spectral side has not been completely regularized so far. So, uh, okay, and Jackie and Alice, they propose to compare this relative trace formula by going through an equality between the geometric size. I'm not going to say exactly what, how it goes, but let me just say that there is an explicitly defined transfer between test functions f and f prime, denoted by this double arrow, which is defined by certain identities between relative orbital tables. And this is tailor-made so that once you have such a transfer, then you can compare the two relative trace formula on the geometric side. And let me just say that it's known now that the transfer exists in both directions in this case, and it has been proved by Wei Zong first, uh, not have in places, and then you have also you need a fundamental lemma, which has been proved by Ziwa Yun and Julia Gordon, and then the work it has been uh, completed at the Archimedean place by Eng Shui. So how do we apply our main theorem in this situation? Uh, so I just, uh, I've just copied here the two relative trace formulas. And so recall that uh, in the statement of our theorem, we're assuming that the Bayesian is cuspidal, so both pi and pi e are cuspidal. And therefore using our main theorem, theorem A, we can construct for them uh, multipliers, S multipliers for uh, suitable finite set of primes S, uh, killing everything that is not cuspidal and preserving pi and pi e. Right. So now if we start with two, the point is that we can arrange also this. So this is slightly technical, I will not enter into the details, but we can arrange these multipliers to be compatible with the transfer in the sense that if F and F prime are transfer of each other, then so do the convolution by the two multipliers. So th this requires a spectral characterization of transfer, uh, which is known in this case. And then if you go to spectral again, it's easy to see. And one note here is that it's not known in this situation if the transfer preserve K finite functions at the Archimedean place. And so here it's, it's important to work with uh, the full Schwartz space in particular. But once you have this, now you have, if you start from two uh, functions which are transfer of each other, you apply the two multipliers, you get functions which are transfer of each other, but now you can plug them in, to, in the relative trace formulas because I, as I discussed in the previous slides, in this case, the spectral sides are absolutely convergent and there is no problem of making sense of both of them. So they make sense and then we can compare and, and comparing, the geometric sides will get an identity on the spectral side. And then there is a, a classical way to isolate uh, spectral contributions. And you end up with an identity like this, where on one side you sum all, only uh, over forms we are, which are in the base change of pi e. And on the left, you know, sum only on forms which are in a cuspidal representation pi prime with the same base change as pi. And from, su from such an identity, it's relatively easy to deduce now that this condition that the, the, the gangrose facet period uh, does not vanish on one of the pi prime appearing on the, in the left-hand side, if and only if the two periods on the right-hand side are non-zero, and then we can use the work of Clique Rallis and Jackie Petsetsky, Shapira and Shalika, Shapiro and Shalika, so to deduce the gangrose process conjecture, essentially. So this was the original idea of uh, Jackie and Ravis. And uh, there's a similar way to get the Ichino Keda conjecture. Oh, sorry, I'm already over time. But this, this is just to give you uh, an example of how you can apply uh, the main theorem to a comparison of uh, trace formulas. Okay, can, can I take maybe just two more minutes because I have one last slide? Absolutely. Okay. So, because it will answer your question, Erez, or not answer it, but ask it again. So, uh, in the last slide, I've prepared some open questions, and these uh, uh, are all related to uh, the harmonic analysis of a reductive group over R. So, and related to space of multipliers more precisely, and I have ordered them by increasing order of interest, at least to me. 
So the first question is exactly Eric's question, I guess. So uh, in CRMB, I've stated uh, the existence of many elements of many infinitesimal multipliers for this group and uh, with a description of what they are. And so a natural question would be uh, if we get all of them in this way. So is it the full space of infinitesimal multipliers? So I uh, don't have the answer to this question. Uh, my wild guess would be yes, but I don't know. I have no argument to give in that direction. So, but this is for infinitesimal multipliers. And then we can try to ask another question is what about general multipliers? So are there other elements, other multi Archimedean multipliers which are not infinitesimal multipliers? So the short answer is uh, obviously yes. Uh, so for the following reason, if your group has a center, then you can always act also by the center. Uh, then it gives you a multiplier. And it's not uh, infinitesimal because it will depend on the central character of the representation, not the infinitesimal character. But this is somehow cheating and we would like to see more. And uh, here is one basic question that I uh, would like to ask. So if you take PGL2, then it has no center. And then if you use the infinitesimal multipliers, we cannot separate the two families of principal series, which are, so one is induced from unramified characters and the other one is induced from unramified characters tensor by the sign. And so the question is, can you separate such representations using a multiplier? So of course you cannot do it for any, for all lambda because some of these uh, principal series we share common sub quotient and then it's easy to see that you cannot separate them. But I would like to see a multiplier allowing you at least to separate uh, these two representations for generic lambda. So when you say we don't have, you mean we don't know to have or? I, yes, uh, I mean, yes, I don't know any multiplier separating the two and uh, all the multipliers I know don't separate these two because they're all factorized through uh, the infinitesimal character of GL2. But you don't know that you don't have. No, I expect, I, I, yes, I expect that there is something that separates the two, but I don't know uh, proof. Right. And the last question is more open, but it goes, I mean, the question is basically, uh, so far uh, I was only talking about multipliers, but there is a, a natural extension of a description of multipliers, which is a Palevinar theorem, and describing the full spectral transform. And there is such a theorem for uh, the space of compactly supported smooth functions, which is due to Archer, and then extended by Delorme. So in the Archer case, it was for k and functions, and then Delorme extended it to any test functions, but still compactly supported. And my question is, um, Maybe you can get a, a Palevina theorem also for the short space. And my hope is that the description will be more explicit than in Arthur. And then from and from there, maybe we can get more multipliers. But just an open question. Okay, we stop here. Thank you for your attention. Any more questions for the speaker? In the other cases where GGP is known, uh, do the assumptions imply that the base change is cuspidal? Um, so it depends because there is also uh, work using uh, uh, the descent method. Mm -hmm. So I think the Yu Jiang and Lei Zhang, they have a result for the gangrose passer conjecture without assuming that the base change is cuspidal. But they don't have the Chinook Keda formula, as far as I know. But otherwise, the other results using the uh, Jacques Rallis trace formula, uh, they have local assumptions uh, entailing, in particular, that the base change is cuspidal. Okay, so this is strictly stronger than all of those. Yes. Uh, also, do you expect that these this technique will be able to handle non-cuspidal cases? Uh, uh, yes, actually, it's work in progress with uh, Pierre-Henri Chaudoir and uh, Michel Zidor. 
but there's something to do on the linear side because now uh, since the base change is not cuspidal, we can still isolate the cuspidal datum of the base change. And, and uh, we have a method to show, to compute the spectral side of the trace formula for such cuspidal datum. That's it, uh, yeah. We don't have the full spectral expansion still. Any more questions? Maybe I'll have a couple if you don't mind. The okay. first question is about the function field case. Uh, so the function field case, so if you, so for theorem A, or the, or the theorem on multipliers. All right, so actually function field is in a sense easier because if you go back to, so then you can just use the spherical equal algebra at all places. So this is the proof. And there are two things that change. So first, uh, uh, only not a countable uh, number of families of ascension series, but only finite numbers, because you fix the level. And so, and here, so if you see when I, uh, you, you, you need to cut out the set of spectral parameters of one family, you have to compare always the Satake parameter at one prime p with the infinitesimal character at the Archimedean place. In um, the function field case, you can basically compare any two places because they have the same residual characteristic. Problem here is that you cannot compare two primes that are different. The Satake parameters are two primes that are different. Uh, because log P and log L are, uh, uh, how do you say, irrational to each other. You cannot write an equation like this between lambda P and lambda L, for example. But okay, probably this technique should adapt to the function field case, but we didn't write it. So. Yeah, somehow it seems that there is some cover from one parameters of, I mean, it depends on the, what happens at the place P, I guess, uh, the, the, the relevant Q or something. And maybe, I mean, there's no kind of, uh, at infinity, somehow you book to everything, but in the function mm -hmm. case, you cannot find one place which fits all. Yes, you can replace the Archimedean place by any given place. Somehow. But you, you will only somehow see some projection of the, I mean, it's only modulo some, Lattice, so ah. uh, yes, yes, yes. But if, if your place has a, a minimal residual characteristic, should be fine. No, the characteristic is fixed, but the... No, minimal uh, cardinality of the residual field. In the corner. If it's of uh, the residual field is precisely FP, then you can compare it to any other. Mm. I didn't think about this question. Uh, my, my, yeah. Okay, the other question uh, is about um, what happens if you try to do similar theory for a fixed prime P instead mm -hmm. of talking in place, because you, you just fix the level, so of course there's no issue, yes. but if you try to vary the level, let's say just powers of P, Mm -hmm. Is there some, at least at the level of formulating something, is there some hope to formulate something? Like the, uh, want to, uh, you can always replace the, uh, you can use Bernstein center. Is it what you? Yes. Oh. Um, but what, if you want to isolate one, I mean, you want to isolate a family of representations. But I, I want function, not just not just smooth function. I want functions which have some uh, that are really, I mean, continuous. Maybe plus something. Maybe the there is some dependence on how they oscillate, so to speak. But I don't want just smooth function. For smooth function, that's of course. Very ah, okay. Smooth. You you want functions that are at a periodic place that are not smooth. Yeah. But then I don't know. <laughs> okay. You you want to use a, a more general space of uh, test functions. Yeah. 
no idea. Sorry. It's interesting. Okay. Neither do I. <laughs> okay, great. A any more questions? So if not, thanks again for this wonderful talk. And uh, I hope we thanks for coming. So Dima, are you shutting down the recording now? Yes. Okay. <laughs>